United States Army presents The Big Picture. An official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. Since Lexington and Concord, clergymen in uniform have served American troops in peace and in war. From Bunker Hill to Brandenburg Gate, the chaplain has brought men to God and God to men. The United States Army chaplain is many men. First and foremost, he is a man of God, bringing religious guidance to soldiers of all faiths. He is a staff officer, advising the commander on religious and spiritual matters wherever United States troops are stationed. He is a counselor and friend to the men he serves. He is instructor, teacher, spiritual physician, bringing comfort and the strength of religion to the sick and wounded. He is advisor of those seeking help, confidant of the trouble. He is with his congregation wherever they may be. The chaplain's religious services, his pastoral activities, his duties as a staff officer are all directed toward one end, the glory of God and the service of his country. By them, he helps the commander accomplish his military mission. Excuse me, sir, were you talking to me? Yes, Captain, I was saying that the chaplain can help you in your job as a commander of troops. Oh, sure he can. As long as he gives us a good service on Sunday and fills up the chapel. I wasn't referring only to his religious services. Oh, you mean those, those other activities? Frankly, I, I don't see how that helps me much. My job as a commander is to train men for combat and lead them. Suppose they won't follow. Suppose they have problems that you don't understand or haven't the time to solve. Oh, don't get me wrong. I respect the chaplain. I like to have him around. But I can take care of things in my company. You give me good NCOs, I'll get the job done. Getting the job done is a big order, Captain. Takes all kinds of know-how to fill it, including the special know-how of the chaplain. Mind if I call a few witnesses on the subject? Witnesses? I hope that doesn't mean I'm on trial. <laughs> we're all on trial, Captain, when it comes to whether or not we're making the most of our opportunities. Witness, Colonel Robert Gaines. Most officers have their own idea of what the chaplain's job is. But few of us really appreciate the full extent of it. I found this out while I was commander of an officer candidate regiment some years ago. Come in. Candidate Thomas, Company D, reporting as ordered, sir. I've been going over your performance reports, Thomas. You made a very fine showing during your first three weeks. Now something's happened. According to this latest report, last weekend, before your class was to leave on a training problem, you tried to get excused. Apparently, you had no good reason. How do you account for this? No excuse, sir. You were on your way to setting one of the best records of any candidate we've ever had. You might have been a good officer, Thomas. Does that mean I'm being washed out, sir? Is that what you want? No, sir. Well, then, you better shape up. I think you can, if you set your mind to it. Yes, sir. That's all, Thomas. Dismissed. Excuse me, sir. Oh, there's what I would call an unhappy-looking soldier. Yes. But he could be a good one if he can get himself straightened out. Mm. You know, Chaplain, there's something bothering that man. Mm. Oh, do me a favor, will you? Yes, sir. 
Look into it. Well, I'll look over his history. See if I can spot anything that I can do something about. I'm sorry, I was expecting my husband. Oh, yes, I know. I'm Chaplain Deegan. Chaplain? Is Don all right? Oh, he's fine, Mrs. Thomas. Oh. Won't you come in, Chaplain? Oh, thanks very much. Oh, Chaplain. Don should be here any moment now. We're going out to dinner and then to a movie. Well, I'm afraid that's what I came to talk to you about, Mrs. Thomas. Your husband asked me to tell you that he's, he's not going not to be able... He's not going to be able to make it again this weekend. I'm sorry. His class has to go out on another problem. Chaplain, I'm getting so tired of this army and this school and this whole place. Oh, now, Mrs. Thomas, why don't we sit down and talk about this for a little while? This is the third weekend in a row that he hasn't been able to make it. Well, I'm sure that he's just as disappointed about all this as you are. You know, Mrs. Thomas, OCS is no picnic for your husband. I know it, Chaplain. And I don't want to be selfish about it. But it gets so lonely here during the week all by myself. Well, evidently, your husband's been worrying a great deal about you. It's beginning to affect his work in school. I didn't know that. Well, it's not something that he'd want to talk about, I guess. I thought Don wanted me here, near him. We thought we'd at least have the weekends together. But every time we are together, Don's so on edge. We argue a lot. I wonder, Mrs. Thomas, if, if both of you aren't, well, defeating your own purpose. I mean, you're staying down here while he's going to school. You know, officer candidate training is never easy, even when a man's giving everything he's got to it. When he has to divide his time and his attention... Do you think that I'm wrong in wanting to be with my husband? Oh, now, believe me, the Army's not trying to break up families, Mrs. Thomas, but, well, just now... Don needs your understanding. Even more than that, he needs your patience. As I say, OCS is a tough grind. This commission is very important to Don, isn't it? Well, it could mean a great deal to both of you. Did Don ask you to come here and tell me all this? Oh, no, no, no. It was my own idea to come here. Mrs. Thomas. The country needs military leaders, and your husband has the makings of a mighty good one. Now, I'm sure that you, above all, want him to make the grade. Maybe it was a mistake, my coming down here. I guess love can be a very selfish thing. Well, let's say that sometimes it can be a little too possessive. My friends and... My family are in Seattle. I suppose I could go back there until Don finishes school. Sure. Do you think he'd understand? I wouldn't want him to think that I was running out on him. Well, why don't you talk it over with him, wife to husband, and let him know that you understand his problem? I'll do that. Thank you, Chaplain. Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. I had no further problem with candidate Thomas. He finished OCS near the top of his class and distinguished himself as a combat commander in Korea. Today, he's a fine officer with a promising future, thanks to John Deacon, chaplain, U.S. Army. But that was a family problem. I admit the chaplain's very good at that sort of thing. Well, let me point out that it wasn't just a family problem. The Army gained a good officer because of the chaplain's help. Well, yes, but... Well, it was an isolated case. I just don't see how that All helps. All right, let's consider another case, Captain. Witness, Major General Charles Baker. As I remember, Captain, it was during the drive to the Rhine in World War II. Our regiment had been hit hard. We were pulled back in reserve to a small German town that had previously been under our artillery fire. We tried to get the town running normally, but right from the beginning there was trouble. The people were sullen resentful. I had to deal firmly with them. 
but I kept looking for some way to get them on our side and make our stay in the town less difficult. Chaplain Kane, our regimental chaplain, was well aware of the problem. Ja, bitte entschuldigen Sie mich. Oh, das ist richtig. That's all that's left of the pulpit. It was a very fine pulpit. It was made by my great grandfather. He was a fine woodcarver. This was your church? We had a stained glass window over there. It was over 300 years old. It used to splinter the sunlight into a hundred different colors all over the church. The sunlight is still there. Yeah. We had many treasures in this church, sacred objects, tradition of centuries. They're all gone now. Your guns. In war, as you know, Pastor, sometimes things happen that neither side wants. Oh, you, you're a pastor. I am a chaplain, yes. Oh, then you can understand. Yes, I can. You and I, we both know that war is cruel and wasteful. And we try to tell our people, but sometimes they don't listen. Perhaps in your land they listen to other voices, voices that spoke louder. Yeah. But uh, people must go on living. They need food, and shelter, clothing. But more than anything else, they, they need a place in which to worship their God. It was such a beautiful church. Here they brought their children. They saw them married. They buried their dead. In joy and in sorrow, they came here. It was their life. Perhaps I can arrange to get another building that you can use as a church. It would not be the same. Pastor, Pastor, we want to help your people. If only they could understand. Perhaps if you spoke to them, in the meantime, I'll talk to the authorities and see what we can do for your people. The answer is no. You've had all the time you're going to get. I want that report by 2100. Now look here, Chaplain. I didn't expect these people to greet us with open arms. But as long as my troops are in this town, I'm going to go on dealing firmly with anyone who interferes. I realize that, Colonel, but may I suggest there may be another way of dealing with the situation? Another way? This morning I met the pastor of the town church, the one we had a clobber with our artillery. Mm. He may be able to help us. Colonel, he tells me his people are hungry and cold. They haven't got enough food or clothing. Some of them haven't even got a place to live. We're trying to do the best we can for them if they give us a chance. I know that, sir, but what I'm getting to is the problem may be bigger than just taking care of their physical needs. Let me put it this way. In these isolated rural towns, every street, every house, every stone almost has a tradition. Well, unfortunately, much of that tradition has been destroyed, particularly along with the focal point of these people's lives, their church. That church was being used as an OP, directing those 88s that were holding us up. I know that. Anyway, there isn't much I can do about that now. I'm not so sure. Well, what do you have in mind, Chaplain? Well, Colonel, to these people, their church is not just a place of worship. To them, their church is a symbol. It's a symbol of all the traditions that were life to them. Well, now it's all gone, and there's a vacuum. Well, right now, they're filling that vacuum with bitterness toward us. But why not give them something else to fill it with? Give them a place of worship. Give them the assurance that we care about them. I think that would change things. 
Make them feel a little less hostile. We can't very well build them a new church. No, sir, but we might do something about the old one. Well, I suppose we could get the engineers to clear the rubble. And we might be able to spare them some material to patch the roof. Colonel, I'd really appreciate that. Okay, I'll put men and equipment on it, Chaplain. You follow it up and keep me informed. Yes, sir. Anything you need, just let me know. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, we couldn't do an awful lot with that church. But the fact that we tried went a long way toward filling the vacuum in those people's lives. I can't say that the trouble completely disappeared. But we were able to establish order. And the life of the town went on. The point is, Captain, we were only a small part of a big army. We had a problem that wasn't covered by anything in our books. Fortunately, we had a man with us who knew a book that did cover it. Sanford Kane. Chaplain, United States Army. Well, I think you've got a point there. <clears throat> but that was back during the war. It was an unusual situation. The chaplain just happened to fit into it. There's more to it than that, Captain. Much more. War or peace, the chaplain can put his unique background to work helping the troop commander in many different and often surprising ways. Witness, Colonel Alan T. Garnett, to every commander, the morale of his men is a vital factor in fulfilling his military mission, whether in combat or peacetime. A lot of things contribute to morale, especially around the holidays. Captain, I remember one Christmas in particular. Well, the office certainly did well by you with the decorations this year, Colonel. <laughs> well, now, let's see. Oh, yes, uh, we've just received the circular on the leave policy for the Christmas holidays. Mm -hmm. It's about what I expected. Ted, is it just my imagination? Or do things seem to be unusually quiet around this post? Quiet, sir? Well, you know how it is around here during the Christmas holidays. Oh, yes, sir. Usually by now, the unit commanders are getting the gripes from all sides from the men who pull the Christmas duty. When I come to think of it, I haven't heard a ripple. Hardly seems natural, does it? I was talking to one of the company commanders this afternoon. And he told me the morale around this post was higher than he's ever seen it for this time of the year. Well, now, that is serious. Well, maybe it's the calm before the storm. Well, let's hope not, hmm? You know, Ted, I'm curious about this. Tell you what, why don't you ask around and see what you can find out, huh? All right. There's got to be a reason. Well, there usually is. Cigarette? Oh, thank you, Colonel. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Do you notice anything strange around the post? Well, strange? What do you mean, Colonel? Well, uh, different. Like, uh, well, here it is right before Christmas, and everybody seems so happy. No gripes. That's right, sir. I've been wondering about that myself. No holiday gripes. Just doesn't seem right. Yeah, that's it. You got any idea what's happened? No, sir. But it sure doesn't sound like this man's army. Well, ask around and see what you can find out, huh? Yes, sir. There has to be a reason. Of course, there was a reason. But I didn't find out till after the holidays. The explanation, though, was there all the time. Maury? Hey, cut it out! Maury! Yeah, what is it you want, huh? Oh, Chaplain Siskin, I didn't know it was you. That's all right. <laughs> Maury, how are things? Everything going along smoothly? Oh, sure. No problems? No, no, everything's good, fine. Good. <laughs> Maury, when's the last time you caught CQ? What? Just a couple of weeks ago. Why? Did I do something wrong, Rabbi? The question is not whether you did something wrong, but whether you'll do something right. I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't follow you, Rabbi. Charity, Maury. Charity. You do believe in charity. Oh, of course I do. I, I'm always 
contributing to those uh, collections you make. No, I'm not talking about those kind of contributions. I'm talking about the greatest gift of all, the gift of yourself. I guess I'm just not with it. I, what is it you want me to do? Take CQ from a cardinal so he can be home with his wife and kids for Christmas. Gee, Rabbi, I was hoping I was going to get a pass myself. Maury, how would you feel if you caught CQ for Yom Kippur? Okay. Without anyone in headquarters knowing anything about it, Chaplain Siskin, our post-Jewish chaplain, had made the rounds of the Jewish men who hadn't drawn duty for Christmas. It certainly wasn't the most popular mission in the world, but Chaplain Siskin, well, he knew his congregation, and right up through the ranks, they entered into his plan. Chaplain Siskin was well aware of our annual holiday morale problem, and so he decided to do something about it on his own. In my army experience, I remember Christmas in many strange places and under many unusual circumstances. But one of my most pleasant memories for that holiday season was one Rabbi Abraham Siskin, chaplain, U.S. Army. I think I'm beginning to see how it works. I guess I've had kind of limited ideas about what the chaplain's job is. That's the mistake some troop commanders make, Captain, not being alert to the many different capabilities of a chaplain. I'd like to cite one more case. Witness, Colonel Charles Barth. You know, I knew a chaplain who not only helped his commander, but altered the whole course of a man's life. At the time, I was chief of orthopedics at a general hospital toward the end of the Korean War. Now, late one afternoon, I was making a check of the war. Oh, nurse. Any change in that man, Parsons? No, sir. He just lies there all day staring at the wall. When Captain Slezak was making the rounds this morning, Parsons wouldn't even talk to him. Well, you never get well with that attitude. Somehow we've got to reach that man, nurse. We've got to make him realize that we're trying to help him. Chaplain Green was in this afternoon. Oh, and did Parsons talk to him? No, sir. Well, the chaplain tried to draw him out, but it wasn't any use. But Chaplain Green said that he wanted to talk to you about the case. Just how serious is his condition, Colonel? Well, let me put it this way, Chaplain. Medically, I think we can help him, but that's only half the problem. I know what you mean. Nurse tells me he won't speak with anyone. Well, not when he's awake, anyway. Oh? You mean he talks in his sleep? Well, one of my wardmen told me that sometimes he seems to be having a nightmare and he mumbles some foreign-sounding word. I don't mind telling you, Chaplain. This one has me stumped. Was the wardman able to make out that word? Well, he said it sounded something like shalom. Oh, that's Hebrew, isn't it, Chaplain? Yes. Strange word for the man to use under the circumstances. Why do you say that? Well, shalom means peace. And just now, I don't think our patient is very much at peace. Chaplain Green's curiosity about Parsons was as strong as his compassion. Something about that sullen figure with its face to the wall called out to him, as if the sheer silence of the man was a cry for help. Chaplain Green checked over the soldier's service record, looking for some clue that might point the way to reaching him. He contacted everyone who might know something about Parsons. Gradually, the chaplain pieced together enough information to suggest a plan. Hello, Walker. How are you feeling today? Oh, great, Chaplain. Just great. I got another letter from home. Oh. Susie says the kids are getting to look more like me every day. <laughs> Is that good? Huh? Hey, Chaplain. <laughs> oh, um, by the way, Walker, you've done quite a lot of skiing, haven't you? Oh, I sure have, Chaplain. In fact, I'm a very good skier. Uh -huh. Maybe you can straighten me out on something. Sure. Uh, some friends and I were discussing the Olympics the other night, and we couldn't remember who took the slalom or downhill cup in the 48 Winter Games in Oslo. Oslo? Yeah. Oh, no, Chaplain. The 48 Games were held at hmm? San Moritz. Are you sure of that? Yes. Funny. I have sworn the 48 games were held in Oslo. No, Chaplain. He's right, Chaplain. The 48 games were at San Moritz. Thanks, Sergeant. Are you interested in skiing? I was. So with a little help from Corporal Walker and the section on the Olympic Games from the World Almanac, 
Chaplain Green had opened a door. Now, it took many visits by the chaplain to widen that opening, but gradually he was able to draw Parsons out and get him to a point where he was willing to talk about himself. Well, what gave you the idea I was interested in skiing? Apparently, you'd been having nightmares. The wardman was able to make out a word that sounded like shalom. That's Hebrew for peace. It didn't seem to go with the nightmare. Hmm. What I probably said was slalom. That's what I figured, after I did a little investigating. That bit between you and Walker, that was for my benefit? Mm -hmm. I used to like to ski, Chaplain. I was good at it. I wanted to try out for the Olympics. Everybody thought I had a pretty good chance. You know, the top of that ski run is like the top of the world. Uh, I don't kid myself, Chaplain. I've had it. I'm all through. Skiing, the army, everything. Chaplain Green visited Parsons every day. He talked to him. He tried to make him realize that more than anything else in the world, he had to want to help himself. And then later on, he discovered that this man had a facility for languages. So he encouraged him to use this knowledge, to brush up on his languages, so he'd have a special skill which the army could use. Convalescence was long and slow, but Parsons had the advantage of the best medical care that the army could offer him. And he had another advantage that went hand in hand with it, the spiritual strength of the chaplain, urging him on, giving him hope and strengthening his faith. So he wouldn't be able to ski, and perhaps his career as a combat soldier was over. But the chaplain had made him realize that there were other things for him, if he wanted to help himself. Well, eventually, Sergeant Parsons' facility with languages got him into the military intelligence, and there he's made a fine career for himself. The recovery of our number one problem patient at that hospital was a victory for all of us. But all of us knew that that victory was due to the compassion and ingenuity of William Green, chaplain, U.S. Army. I'd always thought of the chaplain as someone living and working in a little world all his own, hardly a part of the military picture. He is a part of the military picture, a vital part. And the wise commander takes advantage of this fact. You've given me a lot to think about. I just never realized that the chaplain could help in so many ways. When you come right down to it, Captain, it is through his deep concern for the individual that the chaplain helps you, the troop commander, fulfill your military mission. I know. And after what I've just been shown, I think I might make a pretty good witness myself. Well, then, Captain, why not join us? Yes, sir. The Big Picture is an official report for the Armed Forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the Department of the Army in cooperation with this station.